G'day guys. Had a couple of people ask me about coils and do bigger coils drain the batteries faster on a pulse induction detector? And the answer is no. And I will explain why this is a fact. You'd think that a bigger coil such as this very large 25 inch nugget finder mono coil would uh, require more energy or source more current from the detector. What I'm going to do, I'm going to compare this monster of a coil against this one, a little tiny eight by six mono, and we'll see what happens. Now, I'm very cramped here for space, so I'll try and do as best I can. On the bench, I have my LCR meter, which is um, inductance, capacitance, and resistance. And this is uh, an interesting meter because it'll test at both one kilohertz, if you can see there, and 120 hertz, so you can do low frequency and medium frequency measurements. I'll put it there. I've made up an adapter for the coil. Done a little bit of Vero board so I can change the configuration. If I want to test a um, receive coil on a double D, or I want to test um, the mono coil of a double D, or in this configuration here, just a mono coil. So what we'll do, we'll measure the small coil first. And that's this little nugget finder, plug plug for Rowan. He makes good coils actually. I don't mind um, nugget finder coils. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So we'll get this, this is the um, small coil. Plug it in there, hit the power button, and it should come up in inductance straight away. Let's have a look. Okay, 290 microhenries. Now the early mine lab coils, a lot of them uh, were about uh, 310, 320. This one's 290. Um, anything between 280 and 323, probably push the 340 uh, on a standard detector, will work. And we have a look at that. We've got 290 microhenries. We're measuring it at one kilohertz, so I can change it to 120 hertz. And it wants to say millihenries, so it's 0.294 millihenries. It's wiggling around a bit. It's probably, I haven't got the connectors in properly or something, but uh, yeah, on the bench, going near metal and that shouldn't have any effect. It maybe move one microhenry or something. There we go, I'll stick it on a metal speaker. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Sticking on a metal battery over there, nothing happens. So we'll go back to a, a kilohertz. So now I want to say it's 267 microhenries. It's probably because I put it on that big piece of metal over there. Yes, it's killed the coil, killed the cure of the coil a little bit. So if you have a look at up the top um, right hand corner, it says Q of the coil, which is how good the coil is. 2.90. Now, if we put that on the, whoopsies, we put that on the battery there, then it does drop 2.6 odd or so, and the inductance has gone down to 271.5 microhenry. But it's neither here nor there. You're not going to go and um, detect on solid pieces of aluminium. So basically, you're looking at 290 odd 
micro henrys now let's go into we can't look at capacitance because we're on the wires uh it's not going to tell us anything so we'll go into resistance and resistance at one kilohertz this is where it gets interesting at one kilohertz the resistance well it's not really resistance it's more of a mixture of resistance and the impedance of the coil and if i drop that to 120 hertz There you go. It's basically 0.6 or 0.7 of an ohm, close enough. So if it went down to DC, uh, which is just direct current, um, like a standard multimeter type arrangement. If you can get the accuracy on it, if it's a low range multimeter, um, that would probably be showing more like about half an ohm, about 0 0.5 of an ohm. So, that is that with that coil. Okay, turn this off. And I'll disconnect the small coil. And put in behind me. Now we'll connect up this big 25 inch coil. Okay. It's plugged in. Power on and it'll fire up in the inductance mode. And it's exactly 300.1 microhenries, give or take. It's um, pretty good. Okay, Q on that coil at one kilohertz, 2.37. It's, it's much as the same as the other one, just a construction technique. Uh, you know, if you start changing the spacing of the windings when you wind the wire around the coil that'll change the cue also uh, the spacing of the shielding to the coil windings that will change the cue also um, the um, what do you want to call it uh, materials that are used for the shield um, materials or type of wire that's used to wind the winding in the first place. Um, you've got to use Litz wire on these detectors or tin plated um, copper wire with stranding under 0.2 of a millimeter or else you'll get what they call cross-sectional eddy currents. In other words, you get a noisy coil. Uh, when a transmitter turns on and then turns off, you want all that residual energy to get out of that coil very, very quickly and what happens if you start using, um, if you just use pure copper wire, there is enough cross-sectional um, circumference of the wire that uh, it generates eddy currents. So if that was a wire, it'll instead of generating currents going so, it generates currents going round and round. And they take a while to decay. And as your receiver comes on, all your, your poor old receivers get in the woo of these decaying well, they don't really sound like that, but you get the idea of these uh, decaying uh, eddy currents, which will be all around the coil and uh, substantial. So you've got to use very, very thin, stranded uh, wire. Like, this is some Litz wire here. That's Litz wire. It's usually wound in cotton or some sort of polyamide uh, these days. And this is... Um, like if I strip it down a bit and pull off the insulation, you can, I'll just fluff it out. Okay, if you can see that, even though you can see that, I can hardly see it, but uh, there's lots and lots of very fine strands. Now, each one of those strandings is not pure copper, each one is lacquered. So all those strands do not touch each other. They're all insulated, thus, that's how you get rid of or stop the cross-sectional eddy currents from forming. There's there's nothing um, in the frequency spectrum of where these detectors operate that can generate an eddy current um, around something thinner than a human hair. I don't even know if you can see that. Fluffed out there, I've got it on the grey of the meter, you can see it. Yeah. So that's how you get rid of... Um, 
cross-sectional eddy currents and you make a very, very fast coil by using Litz wire. Uh, the other way of doing it is you use tin plated multi-stranded copper wire and I'll show you some here. I'll just uh, find my cutters. I'm going off tangent with, with this at, a, at the moment. Should be looking at the coil. But if you have a look at this stuff here, that's tin plated. And it's very, very fine strands again. Very small. Probably, good, you know, maybe 0.1 or less of a millimetre. That would make very, very good detector um, cable because the tin plating between each wire is resistive in itself. The copper um, running like so uh, conducts the current perfectly and there's no real resistance uh, to you know energizing and getting a signal from the coil but these strands because they're all lightly touching each other the tin plating is slightly resistive and as the eddy currents try and form they literally get burnt burnt off uh, for a better word doesn't really generate any heat but uh, they just uh, die in the resistance so that's the trick now, there is wire out there people have used. Oops, that was my meter turning off. It got sick of waiting. Um, the, there is um, silver plated stranded wire like this. Don't use it, it will not work. Uh, it's too conductive and the whole thing will just look like a big wire as such. And it will generate cross-sectional eddy currents and your detector will be noisy. So don't make coils out of that. Okay. Um, I'll put this back on and uh, there we go. So there we are, 300.1 microhenries. Okay, we'll go into the resistance and we'll do it at one kilohertz. There you go, 5.4. The other one was um, around about six something. So there's not much in it. You know, there's only, um, oh, I've got a visitor coming in. No, left the door open. For, thank you. Hang on a sec. Close the door. Close the door. Oh, God damn it. Okay. Need locks on the doors. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay. 5.451 at 1 kilohertz. And if I drop that down to 120 hertz, 0.835 of an ohm. It will... The other one was about 0.7 something, so it's it's all within ballpark figures, and it's not going to have any real effect. Uh, you know, if you want to get, well, if, if you did measure this with a standard resistor, no, sorry, standard resistor, sorry, that measure the resistance with a standard multimeter. I've got one here, I'll just put it on, it's got a 200 ohms setting. It's probably not good enough to do this, you really want a low ohms meter. So this isn't um, generating a frequency to measure the resistance. It's just um, looking at it in DC level. So we'll get this and I'll unconnect it and disconnect it. Okay. Stick one end in there, the other end in there, and we'll see what happens. This meter's a bit uh, iffy. Whoopsie. Yeah, if the battery's not um, up to date too, it will measure high. So basically 0 0.7, 0 0.6 of an ohm. Wiggle, wiggle, jiggle, jiggle. Depends on how good the connectors are too. But uh, I think the batteries on this might be a little bit um, getting down and thus this meter doesn't read correctly. But yeah. Half an ohm, 0.6, flashing around. You know, it's not, not really a good enough meter to do this. You you really need a low ohms meter. Like, you know, the, that scale there of 200 ohms should be something like 20 ohms. And uh, you get a good reading. But as you can see, a normal coil, uh, mono coil, if you just want to use a standard multimeter, should read around about 
half an ohm. Give or take. Uh, you know, you got to take into account the cable they've used, you know, how thick it is, um, the length of the cable, the inductance of the core, which means how many windings are there. So that adds series resistance as well. But we don't really care about the series resistance as long as it's around half an ohm. And the proof that a coil actually does work, and this is this is one way to make sure everything's relatively working okay. It's not, not like, you know, 100% you know, scientific. But if you have a um, meter like this, and you can say, oh, look, we'll have a look at the resistance and we'll, that's the capacitance, which is useless at the moment. We'll put it on one kilohertz. It says it's five point, nearly 5.4 ohms, but that's reactive ohms, which means it's being generated, a signal's being generated by the meter into the coil and it's measuring basically how much or how quickly that signal um, gets into the coil. The more inductance, the, the more reactive resistance you're going to get anyway. So, okay, one kilohertz, we drop it down, say, put it at 120 hertz, and you can see it drops to 0.8. It's still reactive because we know DC resistance wise, it was half an ohm. But just by changing it between one kilohertz and 120, uh, if you didn't have much of a variance between half and up to six or seven ohms, when you go higher in frequency like that to the one kilohertz setting, there's something wrong, you know. So it actually has to do that. Um, it tells you the winding's okay. It tells you that um, you haven't got water in your coil or in the windings, I should say. You could have water in the coil and it's um, between the windings and the shielding and that won't show. But, you know, if you get water in your windings, um, the whole thing... Um, it's not going to work very well. It's going to give you very, very low readings everywhere. So having a high reactive reading there at one kilohertz means it's a pretty good coil and it's within margin of the other small coil, which I know both of them haven't been out in the water. Um, thus, you know, I, I use that as a yardstick and say that's, that's what they uh, will measure. So turn that off. So um, on all that, you want to work out how much power the coil is using. It's very, very difficult because it depends what um, voltage and pulse size the detector is putting out. Now, if you say um, are using a detector and you've got different modes, we'll just say that you're using a, a GPX detector and you go into what we call normal mode where it, the detector puts out three um, pulses uh, around about uh, 36 microseconds uh, long. Then it puts out, um, oh, they're at 15 volts, should I say. And then we have the five volt pulse, which is about 120 microseconds long. So you'd actually have to look at um, how much energy is in each one of those pulses, how long it goes for it's at 15 volts, multiply that by three. Then you go look at the long pulse and say, that's how I'm getting generated at five volts, but it's 120 microseconds long. And then you've got to look at the inductance of the coil and you've got to look at the reactive resistance. Because when you try and energize a coil, you try and put a... Um, you can look at, even though they're pulsed and they're on-off waveforms, you could treat it like DC and, you know, like the initial, um, trying to hit it with, like even put, just putting a battery through the coil, it'll try and resist the rise in current. That's how coils work. And if you, you're going to take into account, the, uh, you know, the time constants of your signal and the... Um, reactive resistance of your coil, and there's formulas out there you can go and work it all out if you really wanted to. And, uh, yeah, there's no need. As long as you stick the coil on the detector and it works, it's good enough, isn't it? But that's how you'd work it out. So, is there any difference between a small coil and a big coil? The answer is no. Um, you know, we've got a little bit of difference in the 
windings and there's a reason for the difference in the um, amount of inductance in the windings uh, it's more usually <laughs> is it more easy okay it's more easy to get your inductance say you you had a target figure of 300 not you know not that it really matters plus or minus and when you make a coil the first winding mate you put a first winding on and if you could actually measure the inductance as you um, were going you would find that uh, you get a very small amount of inductance for one wind and you put another winding on the inductance goes up a little bit and you put another winding on and the inductance starts going up faster and faster as a um, overall value you know you might put one winding on and, and get um, you know 10 microhenries not that it's pro probably less than that and uh, you put another winding on you're not going to get 20 it's going to be something like 11 or 12. So then you put another winding on it'll then it'll jump to 20 and you put another winding on and it'll probably jump to 40 and you put another winding on it'll probably jump to 60 then it'll probably jump to 100 and when you're trying to do a winding you're trying to aim for that um, 300 microhenry um, you know, target when you make a coil, it's very, very difficult um, on um, a larger coil because the wire is so large in circumference. It's, um, you may get to 280, okay, and you put another winding on and it's because it's just so much damn wire and come back around and it's gone to 260. What do you do? Uh, it's very, very favourable to have the start and end of a coil winding right next to each other. And, you know, you've got to, f you know, fudge the factor a little bit. You know, you find coils and they're, they're particular sizes and, you know, they, they um, have an internal diameter where the coil started and ends up on an outer and it might be a particular way it's wound and it might be um, a thin winding or it might be a thick winding and, the manufacturers will probably play with dimensions a little bit. So when they wind it, they say, look, I put on 18 turns and 18 turns on this former comes up at 300 or 310 or, you know, 280, 290, whatever it may be, that's good enough for them. It will work. And, you know, it's always good if you can get another winding on because the more windings you've got, uh, as long as you've got enough time duration in your pulses, you can actually get more energy out of the coil. Um, if you've only got a short amount of, you know, winding, say, you know, you've got um, the big coil here. I don't know what it's got on it. Maybe, maybe it's got 18, 18 turns. That sort of rings a bell, what I used to make when I made 18-inch 18 coils. You know, you'd know that if you start trying to put extra wire on it, it will give you extra field, but the pulses aren't long enough to drive it. So what actually happens, a coil never... Um, gets to saturation or near saturation of how much energy it can take because it because the coil's trying to stop you putting energy in the, into it so you need a longer time duration to get that energy into the coil and you you want the um, current to keep increasing you don't want to um, get a coil and you say well, here's your signal and what it does the current ramps up and say hits hits um, what's the figure I don't know one amp, and the time duration um, pulse, you know, it, it stays on, but the current never increases. If the current doesn't increase, you're not generating an increasing magnetic field. It, it's completely pointless and actually can go backwards, especially when you're energizing um, a target in the ground. It's better to have the coil switch off on a ramping current uh, and then switch off then go into, um, you know, a little bit of dead time. So, you know, the back EMF pulse dis disappears, some of the ground noise disappears, and then you turn your receiver on. It's quite interesting when you get involved in making coils, you know. Um, I, uh, okay. We can always say some curly stuff here, but, um, you know, there's no coil manufacturer out there, Right that makes the perfect coil. They don't. And there's little little areas where, you know, 
I'm not going to go into detail. People will start pointing the bone at me and cause me a troublemaker, but um, yeah. The coils can be made different and better. Um, years and years ago, I made up a series of coils and uh, we went and tested it. Um, um, well, actually, my one of my associates went and tested it with a local, uh, very, very, very well-known detector company, um, a retail outfit. Um, and they were testing our coils and uh, their tester was saying that our coils blew everything else away. So, yeah, there's coils and there's coils. And, uh, you know, I've always thought about um, going into production, making coils, but uh, it's not really my bag. I've got a vacuum form where I can make um, coils up to 40 inches. And, you know, it's all there. I, I, I can do it, but... I shouldn't even say that because now I'm going to get people wanting me to make coils. No, don't don't ask me to make coils. Um, if you want a good coil, ask my son Dave. Dave makes good coils, and the reason he makes good coils is because I taught him how to make them. So, yeah, Dave can make you a good coil if you want one. He actually makes flexible drag coils. Uh, you can, you know, you can get um, <coughs> a. Um, any size coil made up and uh, you basically use cable ties and stick it on a piece of plywood and drag it behind your quad bike or um, your motorbike or whatever you got, you know, or your buggy and uh, go and uh, drag the ground. But yeah, I was making those years ago, so that, that's gone over the Dave to do that now. But he, he is very, very good. He makes a really good uh, drag coil. And the thing too with our drag coils, because they're flexible, um, I might as well do this. The drag coils are made like this coil. This is my figure eight uh, mono coil for testing indoors. It's not really the optimum coil uh, with a crossover like this. It uh, causes funny phase changes. So, because I know that, it's okay. Like if you put this on a, um, a detector and put it in mono, because of the flip of phase on one, one side of the coil, it crosses over, it literally does a 180 degree. You know, when you have, you know, a plus and a minus and you put them together, it equals zero, right? So that's how this works, except you have an offset. A target could be here or here, right? And because it's here and not there, well, there's no offset, but because all the uh, electrical interference it's coming in or whatever, you know, any sort of EMI, uh, because it's coming from far away, it's hitting both coils. So it hits this one, then it hits this, or it hits one at the same time. But because they're phase inverted, it cancels out all the interference. And basically these things are called an anti-interference coil. But when they were made years ago, I don't know if anyone still makes them, you have this as your receive winding, right? And you put a big transmit loop um, on the outside of it so you know the loop would be around here and yeah they're, they're basically silent but you're only going to get the performance of one size you're not going to get the signal into this one and if you start getting deep targets and the signal does come back into both coils well it's going to cancel it so you know it has to be a damn big coil uh, this this would be great for trying to find you know, uh, pieces of gold, you know, maybe, I don't know, let me think, here we go, fudge factor, uh, 12 inches or so, because if it gets deeper and, and as you go over it, um, you know, you're going to get enough radiated field here, but it's also going to go in here as well, and you get cancellation, but it works beautifully on cancelling EMI, so you, you can detect under power lines with this, not a problem, no worries at all. And if you want one, Dave can make you one of these too. Or you can get some wire and make it yourself. But the critical part is the cable that feeds it. You really need um, the inner part of the cable to be Litz wire. And you need the outside part of that cable to be Litz wire as well. You know, every strand has to be insulated from the other. And because these bend all the time, you, you wind... They, it should be wound as a spiral, a flat spiral, multi-strand 
you probably, if you ever stripped a cable down, you probably see it, but um, doing that gives good shielding. It's probably, you know, about 95%. And you can then, um, you know, bend it. If that was like um, a coaxial braid, first of all, it probably wouldn't work because what would happen is uh, as all the um, strands go over each other, they probably wear through and start touching and then you get the cross-sectional eddy current problem again. So they have to be lit wire construction and yeah there you are but dave makes these in massive sizes so you can get a really big one uh god i think people get them out to six or eight eight feet in diameter and if you've got a noisy area or it's you know just a lot of um, um terrestrial interference you can just flip it like that and uh, stick it back down your plywood and silent and because uh, you've got such a big coil, you know, it's not going to um, cancel out because you're not going to get a target on a really big coil, get into both coils. And yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said. You can, when you start doing this sort of stuff, you can massively increase the uh, input gain of your detector as well. As long as it can handle the ground, you don't want uh, to be on pure ironstone or anything like that. It's because the detector won't handle it. But, uh, you know, if you're on milder soil, you want to get down a bit deep, you know, fantastic coil if you want to, um, you know, go on the beach and try and find um, buried pirate treasure, like uh, a chest, a big coil. Uh, you know, if you're in, in um, you know, you've got power lines running down the road beside the beach and it's making a lot of noise, let's go to a figure eight. It's a way to go. Um, better than a double D, because, you know, you can make these things huge. Yeah, <clears throat> what else was I going to say? Um, don't know. Oh, if you ever want to charge batteries, get yourself one of these things here. Charges everything. Bloody amazing uh, battery charger. Any any voltage, put 12 volts into it, it'll charge up to um, 18 volt packs. It does everything. I think I've said this before anyway, but I've got it there charging some uh, nickel metal hydrides at the moment. But, uh, yeah, that's that's a coil saga for you. Hope um, the people that asked about uh, coils now know. I was going to do another video. I keep saying I was going to do a video on um, on a, uh, a noiseless um, front-end input stage for the detectors. And I haven't done it because I can't find my, um, my uh, item. I was making. I tried some uh, some experiments, and uh, one thing works, and like it's very very interesting indeed. I was uh, just uh, seeing if maybe I can retrofit a Mind Lab um, GP or GPX with it. We'll give it a go. But at the moment, um, what's really given me the the proverbial um, irrits <laughs> is that uh, I've got um, my this this detector here. God's been through the war. It's had so much modifications done to it internally and pulled out and back in and turn and out again and back in. Um, this has got the latest modifications in it, and. It's just been raining and raining and raining. It's going to rain for about the next week and I can't get out to do any tests. So I've got that one there, which I am absolutely chomping at the bit. Look at that. And uh, I've got another version of it here, which is, uh, I call this no ease. I think it's uh, famous, this one. Someone chopped the uh, legs off it. But it's we call it no ease. And that has the same... But a little bit different uh, technology inside this one. But I'm going to see which one's best. But on the bench, bench testing, right? Like I say, this one here, this is just a standard 4500. It's an old one. Nothing done to it. It's exactly factory. And those two detectors that I've done blow this into the weeds. Absolutely smash it. 
And I'm not saying just on depth capability, but the, um, the amount of noise generated um, in the detector is, it's, God, it's like 10 times less. It's so damn quiet, but it gets the signals um, far greater because of the lower noise content. And the ground balance, I run full gain on uh, the other detectors and I can uh, ground balance out the Kalgoorlie Hot Rocks in normal mode, work that out. Never, ever, <coughs> excuse me, never, ever have I been able to do that ever before. You know, there'd always be residual uh, ground noise, but uh, no, it's, it's it's gone. So uh, I think maybe curing a few um, problems that lurk in these detectors um, has uh, cured another issue. Though so I wasn't really planning on doing anything with the ground balance. And uh, yeah, it, it's so much better. It's far more stable and the signals are far more responsive. And I was testing it here. I was testing um, using large targets, small targets, all modes and these two detectors, the new ones I just finished off, which I want to get out and test, um, absolutely smash it. Absolutely smash it. So uh, I want to get out and do some videos. I'll let anyone put their detector up against these. I'll, I'll, I'll put money on it that these will absolutely smash it on depth and sensitivity and quietness. So, yeah. I've done it before anyway. I've, I went and did some... In one of my old videos, I did some depth, depth uh, testing out at Talbot. And uh, I remember we were using um, um, one of the GPZ 7000s. And 4500 uh, absolutely killed it. I, I was surprised. I, I don't know why people... Well, there are people who rant and rave and say, Oh, 7000 is the best detector. Well, I suppose if you found gold with it, it's really good. You know, it's like um, the old story about motor vehicles, right? If you drive, if you drive something from General Motors, um, and people say, "Well, General Motors is, you know, whatever," uh, you're gonna go and say, "Oh no, it's not. It's really good." <laughs> you know, or well, we used to have that uh, here with Fords and uh, Holdens. Um, you know, everyone who drove a Ford was, um, you know, a goose, and everyone who went on Ford camp who drove a Holden was a was a goose as well. So. That's uh, usually what people own is what people stand up for. That's what I've noticed over the years. So, you know, and I'll tell you right now, I had a 7,000. I actually bought one. I went down to um, Coil Tech in Maryborough and uh, I bought the boss's detector off him. No joke, because he, he um, you know, selected that detector himself. I think it was a really good one. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I used it for doing testing. I went out for it once. I never used it again. So I had to sell it. It went over to Saudi Arabia. And uh, yeah, hopefully um, the fella over there is having more fun with it. But, you know, we've had SDCs. Um, you know, I think on one of our last videos, we're doing tests with um, um, the older uh, 4500 uh, modifications and we're killing the SDC 2300 too in sensitivity. So uh, I, I don't know. Um, seeing's believing. Go look at my old videos. Go and have a look at it. Um, it's probably, I don't know, within 10 videos back in the timeline. So, you know, normally I don't usually say this sort of stuff and say, you know, this does that and that does this and that, but bugger it. It's bloody truthful, you know. Um, sue me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm not wrong. I'm dead right. So, you know, if you if you put coil for coil size on these detectors... Um, you know, small coil, put an eight inch coil on the, uh, 4,500 and it, these, these, um, modified ones where you can increase the frequency or should I say the pulse rate and, uh, the sensitivity and the other stuff that brings the noise factor down, um, it's far more sensitive. It's really, really good. So, you know, um, yeah, it, it just is what it is. Go have a look, you know done it, been there, um, go and have a look at the old, really old ones, probably done, um, I don't know, four or five years ago with the 7,000 against the 4,500s, I mean, we're there at the test site at Talbot, and we're 
got the targets um, in and out of the test holes and sweeping over and yeah, we hear, thing, we hear things that um, the other detectors can't hear. And yeah, that's like I say, go and look at the videos. They're, they're, you know, most of them, um, there's always independent witnesses. Um, I think uh, that one we did with um, Matt Calava, um, you know, Matt the Taylor, as people know him. And he's standing there, he's doing the test with me, you know, so... Yeah, that's enough, um, as I say, enough waffle. That's gone for 40 minutes. Okay. Um, if you need to know anything about coils and so forth, just, just go in the comments and uh, ask. Uh, I'll try and get to the questions um, as I see them. But, you know, spread a bit of knowledge around, you know, fi you know get this um, detecting industry. It gets more people into it making stuff. Uh, you know, it's um, there's, a lot, there's a lot to be done. Now... The amount of um, things I've discovered over the years, and it hasn't turned up in mainstream, is mind-boggling. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of magic still to happen in the detecting field. Anyway, catch us later. Bye.